blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then we, oh, okay. So now <laughs> we are officially live in the flesh. How are you, Sharon? How's everything, man? Good. It's been a busy month or so, but I'm very happy to be here with you. Talk about credit cards, all that. How are you? <laughs> Doing good, man. <laughs> Doing good. I appreciate you uh, giving us the, the time today and just uh, hanging out, you know. Um, yeah, of course. On this uh, Saturday, <laughs> Saturday mm-hmm. afternoon for me. I know yours. You're a little bit before, a little bit uh, behind me. Yep. Um, but uh, <laughs> so we'll have some people come in here. I see I got Woodsy. We got Michael Wong. Wong Way Travels already in here. What's going on, guys? So we'll see who's hanging out here. So for people who are unaware, uh, this is Sherwin. He is the <laughs> the S in BS podcast that he hosts. Is who is a co-host to. Uh, Sean Lane as well, who you guys know we had on about, uh, I guess a month or so ago, we had Sean on and he kind of, bro- he kind of broke ground on, on a lot of the topics that a lot of people were talking about in the communities, like, you know, hi, it's the best or, you know, a few other things. So, uh, we, it was great getting his take, but now I really wanted to know Sherwin's story because he is half of the entire show that, that <laughs> you guys do. So I, I really am excited for this today. What's going on? Copious cat, Joe, Beretto, credit connection. Hola. What's going on, man? Yeah, this is going to be a fun one. I'm excited. So I wanted to ask you, Sherwin, uh, before anything, because we just mentioned the BS Podcast, right, which is a, an amazing amazing podcast. If you check the pinned comment, um, Thank the you. channel's there. <laughs> and he has, uh, and they both have just amazing content on a lot of the things that aren't in the typical credit card world, like what's the best trifecta, you know, my my 35-year review of the uh, Amex Platinum card, you know, all these typical videos you see, they go deep. They go deep on the highest level stuff possible. They go into luxury travel, some of the craziest hotels you could ever imagine in the world, you know, lay flat business class flights, amazing stuff that these guys have done. And they're, you know, teaching the rest of the world. What's going on, Chris and Keith? Um, but I wanted to ask you as the first question today, which is how did you and Sean start the bs podcast because i don't think many people know the story of how you guys came together and why you're even talking about all these things in the first place yeah i think we dropped our first episode around may of last year so it's it's actually like a fairly new project but Mm -hmm. you know we've already released i think 40 or so episodes because we do it every week so um it's it's kind of crazy how far it's gone in a short period of time uh, I met Sean actually just online on his Discord uh, because I'd come across when he was a student at UC Berkeley. He taught a course called Intro to Credit Cards, and I came across um, that content online. I thought mm. his res- you know, his videos, lectures, resources were really useful because at at Berkeley they have this thing where you, you know any student can teach a class. Mm. People can actually take it for credit, which is kind of insane. But anyway. So he, uh, I found that content and I joined his Discord and, you know, we were just chatting about Coral Redemptions, our shared love of Hyatt, for example. <laughs> and then eventually we were like, hey, you know, uh, we should start a, a podcast because we are, so I called him once and we were just talking for like three hours because we have a lot of, you know, super strong opinions about this game. <laughs> like, hey, maybe there's value. Um, in our knowledge that we can try to share and we wanted to go for something you know longer form be, and not just like the typical youtube videos like oh the amex gold earns 4x on the rest. <laughs> i mean like, we all know that but uh, like what are the deeper mindsets and strategies to this game so that, that's kind of the the thought process behind there <laughs> that's crazy wow that is really really interesting that it was just like a one, you know, maybe just getting to know each other in the chats and whatnot, and then just doing a call one day and just showing your, your knowledge. That is, that must be, was it really just after like one conversation, or was it like multiple and like, hey, maybe we should start a podcast? Or was like that one, the, that was the one that kind of solidified it? I mean, it, no, I mean, we didn't decide to do the podcast after just one conversation, <laughs> okay. but I could tell that from one conversation, both of us knew a lot of nuance about this game that wasn't really mm. sufficiently discussed in my opinion. And that's what eventually uh, gave us the idea to do it. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Oh my God. What the, what's, <laughs> what wow. in two seconds Tripecta at the same exact time. 
<laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Sean, Sean coming up with a five uh, super chat trifectas are overrated. Oh my god, Thank we'll you. get into it for sure. Thank you so much, John. And uh, final cover, nineteen eighty seven, five another five spot. Anthony Sherwin, what do y'all think of? All right, so we'll, we'll get we'll get into this question, and then we'll get into a little more history because super chat okay. precedents, right? Um, yeah, so yeah, Anthony yeah. Sherwin, <laughs> what do y'all think of an Amex duo? Uh, an Amex duo of the green card, the Amex green, and the blue business plus. Um, and then he also mentions the blue cash preferred and a blue business cash for a cash I setup. See. Okay. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, I think one thing to know at the outset is Amex recently changed their family rules. So there are um, specific orders by which you need to obtain your cards. Otherwise, you will lock yourself out of the bonuses. Right. So, for example, if you plan on getting the green, gold, and platinum bonuses, you have to go in that order green, gold, and then platinum. Because once you get the gold, you can't get the green bonus and then once you get the platinum you can't get the green or gold bonus so mm-hmm. that i think that's just something to keep in mind which is a bummer because like i'm not a big fan of the green myself um because i i mean i think it's like a 150 annual fee or not yeah. really super good credits on it or anything to offset it and a lot of other competitors have you know 3x categories um, that the green has so the green is 3x on dining travel transit so it's a little broader mm-hmm. than the other amex parts which could be nice um but now i feel like it's a hurdle i have to get that card so i don't lock my out of the bonus by going straight for the gold i mean, I think if you're focused on like you know dining grocery the gold card is probably better sell in the green because it's you know 250 annual fee but 240 in credits uh, mm-hmm. the blue business plus is a really good card though um not only is a business card, which means it doesn't add to your 524 chase count, but also it earns uh, 2x membership rewards points on all purchases up to $50,000 per year. And it's no annual fee, which is great. And because it's no annual fee and it's a membership rewarding rewards earning card, uh, you can use it to bank your MR points when you don't have like an annual fee MR card so they don't like, you know, expire or disappear don't have one of those active accounts. So I think it's a worthy keeper. Um, sorry, I think that was a lot of information. But no, it's good. You're good, man. Yeah. Right off the dome. And then BCP and BCC, Blue Business Cash. Okay, so I have a hot take on the Blue Cash Preferred. That is Let's a very overrated card. <laughs> so it is, it's a $95 annual fee and earns 6% up to gross on groceries. Hmm. For up to six thousand dollars a month, which six percent sounds like a lot, but when you actually factor in the six thousand dollar cap as well as this ninety five dollar annual fee, I think I did the math on this once. That effective return drops down to four point two percent when you factor in the annual fee, which actually does not beat the no annual fee city custom cash, which earns you five hundred dollars on your top spending category, including <laughs> grocery, uh, and five hundred times twelve is also six thousand dollars. So. If you're looking at the break-even analysis, uh, the blue cash preferred is a much weaker card than the city custom cash. Um, a blue business cash is salt. I mean, it's a two percent cash back card, um, which I think is pretty solid on the business side. But you know, two percent cards are are nothing unique uh, in this game. You know, Wells Fargo Active Cash, City Devil Cash, a bunch of them all give two percent cash back. So uh, I don't think this specific card especially with a cap and a cap stands out to me okay those are my very detailed <laughs> taste but um anyway what were you talking about <laughs> well well i guess to solidify just that uh because i know i love that that's great um he was kind of thinking what if you as a duo like the amex green and the blue business plus together i guess as opposed to like maybe a, a platinum and a gold or something like that you think that's a viable setup for maybe your average traveler I think it's viable. I think, I mean, I, I, I think generally the, the gold and platinum are better cards, but now that, you know, the optimal strategy due to these family rules has become green, followed by those cards, it may be worth getting. But also, I'll keep in mind, usually the, this is another thing Sean and I emphasize a lot about our in our podcast, is you want to focus, for the most part, more on bonuses rather than multipliers. So, I think a premise of this 
you know, very good question is, you know, how do I maximize my spend categories? And that's great. But if you look at the break-even analysis, you have to spend a lot on these cards to even come close to the amount of points you can get from a different bonus. Um, hmm. So something else to keep in mind. For sure. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it's an interesting setup. It depends. Like if you have the green card and you're like, I'm only traveling once a year, and maybe I like to stay in Airbnbs, and I could use clear. Mm. <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe, yeah. you know, it depends. But so um, many other cards give clear now from Amex that I think more justifiable, right? Like, for example, I mean, the platinum card's not for everyone, but I personally think if you do the math and all the other credits, even assuming you value clear at nothing, <clears throat> you're almost getting clear for free um, on top of the other credits. Whereas mm -hmm. I can't say the same for green because there are not other substantial credits. The other great example is the Hilton Aspire card, which um, beginning with the updates from the end of last year now also come with a clear credit. Even without that clear credit, you are coming ahead with $600 in credits for a 550 annual fee as well as a free night certificate easily worth, I personally think, you know, six to $800, if not more per year. So, you know, if your goal is to get clear maybe think about those other cards I mean, another mantra i guess sean and i frequently talk about is think about the effective annual fees not the annual fees yes the two mm -hmm. other cards i just mentioned hilton spire and platinum which also have the clear credit have higher annual fees than the 150 green but in my view though both of those cards have lower effective annual fees than the green because of the credits they provide. Yes, the credits are annoying to use and you have to discount them. I will concede that point, but it's still at the end of the day more justifiable to me than the card with a medium slash low annual fee without substantial credits or certificates, et cetera. Love it, man. I love it. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Wright, I know, uh, I think that's Chris Wright in your Discord. He said, this guy seems smart. Does he go to Stanford or something? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I mean, the funny story. So, the for those of you who don't know, the a BS yeah. podcast is like a double entendre because Sean went to Berkeley. I go to Stanford. We we're like, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not a brag thing. It's more like let's use this as a branding sort of. <laughs> thing. Uh, and it's <laughs> and it's funny how I think a lot of people think you don't know that. Like you don't know that BS has a different meaning <laughs> than Berkeley <laughs> yeah, and Stanford. Because yeah. I've seen some comments and they're like, BS podcast more like the BS podcast. I'm like, that's the that's the point. Like like literally that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, thanks for stating the obvious, you know. It's <laughs> ridiculous. Um they said yeah. uh, oh, Michael you, W Michael. said <laughs> Yeah, Sharon is the man, love the BS pod. Awesome. Yeah, and I like it because in your uh, in your um, description, or I guess is a bio of your channel, it's like BS podcast, cutting the BS out of you know the normal, I guess the credit card world, um, which is definitely mm, what you guys yeah, yeah. do for sure. Um, so I love that. I love I love all that. Okay, so that's where we get the name and everything. Um, I also wanted to know a little bit of uh, just your story with credit cards because when we spoke with Sean, sure. it was. He he spoke of you know doing some crazy hotels with his families when he was like maybe not even ten years old, and then it kind of snowballed from there, and he got into the game maybe uh, maybe four years ago, five years ago, something like that, and now he's stayed in a million different things. Um, and he talks about a lot of his you know stuff that he's done over the years. But for you, I feel like you're a little bit more mysterious. I don't know. We don't know as much about Sherwin. Versus oh, Wilson. interesting. <laughs> so, <laughs> what's what's your story with the the points of miles game? How'd you get into this whole thing? Yeah, I mean, my parents had always used rewards credit cards for a while, but they weren't like super deep into the niche. I mean, they had like a basic Chase trifecta since like 2016 when mm. the Sapphire Reserve dropped. But I had I wasn't really pension at all in that game, you know. Um, so when I got my first credit card around 18 or 19, it seemed really interesting. I was like, oh, you know you can get a lot of value from these rewards points. Uh, and I'm like a big optimizer when it comes to things. So I did, uh, started like diving into rabbit holes on like which cards get the most cash back on which categories mm. and like really understanding these products. But eventually got to a point where uh, I, I looked more about 
into like the redemption type of stuff on mm. on YouTube. Actually, there's a lot of good YouTube content, and um, yeah, and you know, Sean and like I like to harp on. Sometimes we feel like a lot of the credit card YouTube content is like really repetitive, but you know, it, it was still a really useful resource helping me get started. Um, but then I would, so then I would, you know, read more blogs, look at the Discord, you know, try to plan out the strategy for, for my credit cards and my whole family. Um, eventually, it became like this secondary hobby. It was just like insane to me how much value you could get, not just only from like the outsized value in the the aspirational redemptions, but also just mm. like. Dude, these banks' marketing budgets are huge in terms of the sign-up bonuses you can get, and um, if you really learn the rules and the strategy, you can amass uh, like a good gazillion points <laughs> and, and whatnot. So, yeah, a little rabbit hole. So now, um, I so I I plan the entire credit card strategy for my whole family. So my mom, hmm. dad, and myself. So I you know I tell them when to open cards. Um, what to do with the points and because having three people in it like massively accelerates how many cards and points you can get i say mm. another big help was uh unfortunately i attend an institution with high tuition and uh with high tuition comes high payments with high payments comes high credit card spend you know what you're doing um so that's mm. how we're able to open a lot of big sign-up bonuses in rapid succession. I would say, especially like business cards have big bonuses, but higher minimum spending requirements. Mm. So um, yeah, this is the other thing. People sometimes are afraid of paying certain bills with credit cards because they typically incur a fee. I also say like for the most part, if you're just spending getting the you know 1X or 2X back or whatever, that fee is not gonna be worth it. But if you're, if that's the only reason, you'll be able to hit like a really juicy sign up of this, like on an ink or an Amex or something. Uh, the math really works out. Like maybe you pay a hundred or two hundred in fees, but you get sixty thousand, eighty thousand points or whatever, um, which can be redeemed for even more value um, if you know what you're doing. So it's pretty worth it. Definitely. Um, that is so interesting that you say, uh, if you know how to do it, like your tuition and, and I guess, cause I'm unfamiliar. I'm a person who went to college for a year and I dropped out. So I'm uh, totally unfamiliar mm. with your, <laughs> your, your life and, and everything like that. So, so how does that work? Do you have to pay monthly payments for tuition for Stanford or is it like yearly? Yeah, it's quarterly. Um, huh. so we have fall quarter, winter quarter, spring quarter. Um, and <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It's a lot of money for each one. Um, and so they don't accept credit cards directly. It would be great if they did, but they don't. So we use hmm. plastic that's spelled P L A S T I Q, which allows you to charge a credit card for good or service. And then they'll cut a check to the payee. Um, yeah, it does incur a 2.9% fee, which is like pretty hmm. high, but again, if it's going for a bonus, it's worth it. So, I mean, I end up opening like sometimes multiple cards per quarter each one and sending like four or five different checks for each bill so like probably annoying the heck out of the registrar <laughs> person who has to process yeah them. but yeah you know, it's it's still it's still the money <laughs> that is awesome i love that because more recently i recently moved into an apartment and uh i've been talking about getting like a chasing card every single quarter Mm. And in doing that, I mentioned like, oh, my apartment complex allows me to pay direct with a credit card. So that's easy. But wow. it is a 3% fee. So, mm. but at the end of the day, I'm paying, you know, per ink card that has a $6,000 minimum spend and my rent's 1500 Like every three months, effectively, I'm getting close to that, that minimum spend. So I just figured, why not just open one every quarter? Yeah. And yeah, I am that's paying good. $135 in the fees. But I mean, we're getting like 300k, you know, <laughs> chase points. So it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, no, I'm always worth like, it. even if you cash out the points at one separate point and don't do any of them, you're still ahead of the fee. So insane no amount. Brainer. But of course, yeah. we're doing, we're trying to go for, you know, more <laughs> crazy, go big and go yeah. home, right? It's <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, um, I mean, three three percent is high, but I mean, the I mean, other bills you can pay for a lower fee typically include like federal income taxes. Um, 
you know, I've had success with that. Um, sometimes, oh, what's really nice, this might be a Bay Area specific thing, but PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric, uh, hmm. sorry, electric bill. Uh, yeah. uh, because of California state law, they only charge a nominal like dollar or something fee every time you use a credit card rather than a percentage. Oh. So that really comes in handy. And then you can like, pay, it can like, <laughs> sort of like a Amazon reload your balance for PG oh. sort of things. So you can just pay a thousand, two thousand dollars or whatever. Oh. And then the monthly kind of fees for your electricity kind of just deduct from there. So yeah, that can be a good, I mean, it's, these are really niche use cases, but might be useful for some people. I love it. I've, I've always paid my taxes if I owed, uh, you know, through the, through the, uh, mm-hmm. what is it? USA.gov or whatever it is. And it's like a 1.87% fee. It's like nothing. Yeah. It's, good. it's, <laughs> it's easy. That's I mean, easy even 2% cash back you're coming out. Nice. Oh yeah. Honestly. Yeah. Even, yeah. even at that, yeah. some people are mentioning like, Oh, maybe you should have uh, like smart things says use the build card. You could pay rent and no fees. Um, I have a feeling you have a, a, maybe a strong opinion about the build card. Am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, I think the analysis for whether the built card makes sense is a little more complex than it seems. So, um, as a quick refresher, the built card is like a fairly new product that has, I mean, I think it's really impressive to be honest with what they've been able to come up with. We have great transfer partners, including Hyatt and American Airlines, which not even City has, even though they have their co-branded card, which is crazy. Um, and how it works is you earn 1x points on rent without any fees. So they'll literally cut a check or do an ACH transfer to your landlord. Um, and I think it's great for a lot of people who just you know, want to get this one card, you know, you're paying rent without any fees, you're getting points that you wouldn't have got otherwise. And that, you know, makes a lot of sense. And these are transferable currency points. But I think there is an opportunity cost analysis to think about. Hmm. So, you know, this card is a personal card. It will report to your personal credit report. So it, it does count against 524. I think if you're way over 524, sure, go for it. If you're under 524, I would hesitate. Why do I say this? Think about it this way. Let's say you have a rent payment of like over two or three months, $6,000, right? That $6,000 can be put on plastic, albeit with a 2.9% fee, toward like an ink bonus. But you're going to net... I don't know, 75,000 points, probably more if you have a referral <clears throat> system going on. Now, that $6,000 <clears throat> would only net you 6,000 bill points. And you would have to basically pay, I don't know, $75,000 in rent before you meet, you know, before you get the same amount of points as one, uh, as Sorry, you'd have to pay $75,000 rent before you get the same number of points as like one Chase Inc. bonus that only requires 6000 to spend, albeit with a little fee. So, you know, if you're that type of person who just wants something like set it and forget it, keep uh, you know, keep some points flowing in from rent, great. I, I love the bill card for that reason. But, you know, if you're more down to optimize, I think it's a huge opportunity cost to be putting that spend through uh built because of the huge sign up bonuses you can get so yeah that's kind of my take uh sean and i did a whole episode on the built card where you kind of delve into analysis a little deeper so if you're interested go check that out oh i actually haven't seen that one i think i've watched about one third so far i have to continue okay. going back i, I want to watch the car rental one actually i think keith told me to watch that yeah he did he's in the chat oh, okay yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um okay interesting so I also wanted to ask, uh, so, so along with that, you mentioned that you were, um, I guess when you were joining the points of miles game, you're like a crazy optimizer of all things. And at least in, in this game, you were like, Oh, what's the best cash pack? What's the best multipliers? And then you started getting out to redemptions. But what was that process like to go from, uh, okay, oh, let me get the most amount of money back on spend, you know, just my ordinary spend to now, uh, maybe I should just go for welcome offers and then just, you know, transfer that out to partners and do some amazing vacations with that. Like, yeah. What was that kind of transition for you? 
Interesting. I mean, to be clear, I still do optimize for spent like when I'm going out to eat, mm-hmm. I you know, I think about what card gives me the most number of points back, you know, when I'm yeah. Or, or at the gas station or grocery store, like what card makes the most sense. So I still do optimize mm. for category. I, I don't think that itself changes. But mm. I will say just having a lot of these like high tuition payments um, created the incentive for me to go like sign up bonus hunting mm. and really rapidly like increase the number of cards, number of points. I, I think, oh man, like b- between my dad, my mom and myself, we have at <laughs> least 30 cards, not more. And oh, wow. oh yeah, th- this is the other thing. Like people tell me like, oh, how, you know, how do you have so many cards? How do you keep track? And like, is it it's hard? That sounds really stressful. I really don't think it is. Like I can mm-hmm. probably figure out what, um, you know what what cards to use where like all like i have it all memorized it's not like this whole labyrinth of things i don't know i think it's just it's like because it's such a hobby for me and i'm like really familiar with this space it's not mm. that much mental energy to keep track but i can i can definitely see why it's not for everyone i mean my mom always tells the joke like like she's at the grocery store and she uses the wrong card she immediately gets <laughs> ticks for me uh, berating her for not that anyway so um yeah sometimes i feel like i i do spend too much mental energy optimizing but like it's at a point where like i already know so much that it's not more additional energy to like maintain our system basically <laughs> So, so it almost sounds like, so I understood, but it, it, I'm, I'm laughing because I'm thinking you're saying like, if your mom uses the wrong card, she's getting a text and you almost, <laughs> the way you describe it, it's like you're a dictator and you're just <laughs> looking down upon your family <laughs> and they're going to use the cards the way I want them to use it. They're going to sign up when I tell them to do it. <laughs> I mean, we do um, discuss it together as, as a family and I well, kind of explain right. why. The discussion, right? But you're at the top. Me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they trust me to know like what makes the most sense. So, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, I, I, I laugh, but it's the same exact thing with me and my uh, my wife and everything like that. So, yeah. and it's uh, it definitely, it's definitely worth it to have like player twos. And I guess in your case, maybe player threes or fours um, <laughs> for referrals and whatnot. Um, here's something actually uh, that I would, that I'm thinking of now. How, how would you say, cause that's, it's pretty interesting that you're, you said it like 2016, your parents like had like a basic trifecta. Most parents, even to this day, don't have like really any credit cards, like a Home Depot card. Maybe they have, mm-hmm. you know, something like that. So what, why do you think your parents are like in the game enough to even have like those sort those sets of cards? I think they were just, I think like when the Chase Sapphire Reserve came out in like 2016 or whatever, hmm. my dad was like, Oh, this is really cool. I mean, it was a very revolutionary product back then. I think it really forced Amex later down the road to improve their products. Yeah. So, I mean, he got yeah. Sapphire Reserve, and then he already had a freedom from like that's like thirty years old at this point or something from like his early college days, which you know, and those points combined, and so then we got a Freedom Unlimited, and you know that created a pretty good setup um, for a number of years, but. I think none of us really paid attention to, you know, interesting redemption, chase redemptions, like high or whatever, or just mm. accumulating points. Uh, even before that, I think they were using the Costco card, um, mm. which has like pretty good cash back multipliers. But by the way, I really hate this card. I'll tell you why in a bit. But <laughs> um, okay. the Costco card is very, very popular among Bay Area parents. And I think <laughs> it is a horrible card. Um, so where was I going with this? So yeah, I mean, so they I mean they've been using rewards credit cards, but they did not get to the level of optimization that I have hmm. imposed in the last two years. <laughs> I love yeah. the way you say that, man. That's funny. Got it. Oh, Got thank it. you, Keith. Sure was an yeah. episode about prioritizing subs instead of built card changed my entire perspective about CCs and I'm a homeowner. Wow. Appreciate you. you, Keith, man. I'm glad it was useful. 
20, 20 spot for Mr. Keith. Yeah, he he's been going hard. He's uh, in 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 the Discord. He's like, uh, you know, he's changed his profile picture to the you know the build car. He's like, I'm putting everything on the build car. <laughs> so yeah, uh, he's going all in. Um, and then Michael W says you don't want the rotisserie chicken sub. Uh, I think he is exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> that that is one of the reasons I detest the Costco card because you know. Okay, I mean, on the surface, it seems really attractive. Four percent. Gas, three percent restaurants travel, two percent Costco, one percent. Hmm. But you know that's not competitive anymore, especially when the sign-up bonus is a bag or a rotisserie check. Like, come on, like we're getting, we we want sixty to eighty thousand points, not a, not a five dollar rotisserie check. Like, seriously, that is the sign-up bonus. <laughs> is it really for unsuspecting people? <laughs> no who way. Sign up for it. Um, I mean, three percent restaurants, nothing special anymore. Two percent cost. So, come on, like, um, there's a lot of 2% cashback cards that are Visa that work at Costco. Um, my strat for Costco right now is actually to use the U.S. Bank Altitude Reserve uh, mobile wallet because it is a Visa card. And Costco only takes Visa. But if you use mm. the mobile wallet, you get 3x. Those points are worth 1.5 cents per point earned for travel through uh, the real-time rewards. So that's an effective 4.5% cashback. At Costco, which surely beats the two percent from the Costco. Wow, that's that's really interesting, huh? So, yeah, so, yeah. Thank- so uh, mm-hmm. go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you again, Keith, for that. I really appreciate that. But I, I just need to know: uh, there really is a rotisserie chicken sub. I wasn't familiar with this. I need. This is a yes. sub. I mean, the restaurant. Uh, to be clear, the rotisserie chicken itself is amazing. It has stayed four ninety nine <laughs> uh, for at least a decade or two. And it's delicious, but I, you know, if I'm giving up a 524 slot, I do expect something that is worth more than 499 value. That is so funny. Is that the only welcome offer that it comes with? Uh, I've seen other offers like a like a tote bag, but <laughs> oh my god, you know, so it kind of comes so, and goes. I, I have to ask because this is reminding me. There's another um, credit card YouTuber in the space. Great guy, Josh Butler. Uh-huh. And he made a okay. video about, like, I guess why people love the Costco, uh, you know, Visa. And he made this, and it did, what, like, 100K views. Um, mm-hmm. and, so, and you look at the analytics, and it's all, like, 50 and over. Um, mm. <laughs> so I'm wondering, what, what do you think is drawing people to the Costco card so much? I'm, I'm, I'm really I mean, it's surprised. just, okay, this is another <laughs> thing, right? It's just like, oh, I shop at Costco. I mean, I should get the Costco card. The multipliers look pretty competitive. Hmm. Maybe 15 years ago, that was true. I no longer think that's right. Or, you know, if you're not really in the credit card space, you're just like, I shop at this thing. I'm going to use hmm. this card. The percent back is better than my current debit card setup, whatever. That's the win. Um, so I, I can get that perspective. It's also no additional annual. Fee. I will say no annual fee because you need a Costco membership. But it's no hmm. additional annual fee. Um, so it seems like I don't need to do a break even analysis, yeah. which I think is not a good premise. You should always do a break even analysis with the opportunity costs of other, other credit card options. Um, Hmm. I mean, another thing kind of on this vein is like people getting airline cards, like, oh, I fly Delta. I need a Delta Hmm. credit card. I fly United. I need a United credit card. I mean, uh, sadly, the, the airline credit cards often don't provide the best rewards, even for that airline itself. So hmm. you really need to understand your option. So um, I, I would not just be like, I shop at this thing or I fly this airline, therefore I need to get their credit card. Um, there's more nuance to the game. Gotcha, gotcha. I think that makes sense. A lot of people get the Target card for that reason too, you know, get the 5% off. Yeah, you know. oh, that being said, the Target debit card, yeah. I think is a good pickup because it doesn't you know, counter your credit, but you do get the 5% off. So absolutely, I would recommend. Yeah, <laughs> like <that. laughs> um, I think we got. Oh, um, interesting. Mr. Axed because uh, a lot of people were talking about the U.S. Bank Reserve. Josh just got a congrats, man. Jake Rakir's in here. He said that it's goaded. Um, so, but Mr. Asked, any use case for having the Altitude Connect and Altitude Reserve? Hmm. Okay, so Altitude Connect, I think he's referring to is a ninety-five dollar annual fee card from us bank that gives forex on gas i think that's like its main superpower hmm. now 
it would have been great if you could combine those points with altitude reserve, but you cannot. So the altitude reserve had the special power of its points being worth one and a half cents each mm -hmm. when you redeem for travel using real time rewards. Yeah. The other altitude cards in that series go and connect. Unlike Chase and Amex, those points do not combine with those. So, you, you know, like the points you earn from the altitude connect won't get that extra, you know, 50% value that you get with reserve, unfortunately. So I think US Bank is not useful to think of it as a trifecta or bifecta system hmm. at all because those points are independent. Now, the connect might still be a worthy pickup if you're just interested in the sign-up bonus, which can be worth $500 or more. For I mean, that's pretty solid. Hmm. But I would not get it with the mentality of trying to, trying to like, combine it with the reserve if that makes sense hmm. it's, it's a very different approach from like chase where the freedom cards and the sapphire cards you know work in sync in tandem i i think of the u.s bank cards as all independent products gotcha gotcha so i guess just to wrap up you would definitely recommend the u.s altitude reserve at costco over the costco card <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah for sure i mean there is a break even okay. analysis because it does have a annual yeah. fee but um yeah. for most people it's it's going to come out way ahead do you find it um because that card also comes with um what is it a travel credit yeah it's probably the best tra best credit out there to be on in terms of its ease of use so it, again it's hmm. 400 dollars annual fee but it comes with an annual 325 travel and dining credit literally any restaurant oh. you use also counts toward it and I suspect for many people in this game, spending three twenty five on travel and dining combined should not be too big of a barrier. Yeah. So, for me, hmm. it's effectively a seventy five dollar annual fee card, which is lower than their you know ninety five dollar option actually. So yeah. It's a it's a really big no brainer for me. And their their three X mobile wallet is truly uncapped. Hmm. Um, unlike yeah, so. It, you know, it's just, it's just, I mean, it's just nice knowing whenever I use my Google pay, I'm getting 4.5% effective back wow. out to think about it. That's pretty interesting. I, I didn't know that it was kind of, uh, it was both, I guess, combined travel or dining. So really any restaurant I walk into, I can just pay with that and it'll code. Wow. Yes. Unlike American Express, which forces oh, you to no. go to Shake Shack <laughs> or, you know, or use Grubhub or, or yeah, I mean. They, they keep it simple and i hope it stays that way yeah oh, amex no. really likes the coupon book approach for us this one is just like it's you know it's all dining it's great so, <laughs> so i have to ask too uh do mm -hmm. you have uh amex cards so my my dad and my mom do mostly my dad mm -hmm. um i have held off on it and still have for like a more specific reason and that's a, I wanted to build out my whole chase setup first because mm. of 524. Yeah. And then, I mean, to me, Amex is like a later game <clears throat> option mm. because like they're not too difficult with approvals. So, you know, strategically, it's better to, you know, kind of wait on it. I, I do eventually plan on getting, because they have great cards and, and my dad has several of them, but, um, you know, to maximize the value, to make sure I don't leave anything on the table. That's my mentality when it comes to this. Uh, gotcha. I really try to fill out my whole chase setup first. Um, and and getting business cards was integral. I mean, I, I, I forced myself to stay at 424 for a, a whole year. So I get a bunch of business cards and then, and then finally close the gap with the personal cards and go over. So, yeah. Definitely, definitely. And I see Michael W. coming. He says, incoming daily $2 Shake Shack on the go. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Lord. Do you I mean, have they've a... gone from annual to quarterly to monthly. So, I mean, yeah. not impossible. <laughs> oh, that's true. Do you have any thoughts on what could happen when they do have an eventual revamp of like a platinum or gold? Or, or is there anything that you would want to see? Um, I don't know. I think it's. I think you have to look at a little bit of history. I think, I mean, the platinum card used to be a lower, I think, four to five hundred annual fee, but not much in credits. 
And then, so yeah. over the pandemic, they did a big revamp where they increased the annual fee substantially to, I think, six ninety five. But they also added a ton more credits. And guess yeah. what? People loved it. People would rather pay a higher annual fee with a, a, a ton of credits than like mm-hmm. a lower annual fee without credits. So, you know, would they keep raising the fee and adding more hard to use credits? I don't know because I, I, I mean, I actually know people who have the platinum card just like because it's the platinum card and you don't really use the benefits on it. And like, perhaps those people are subsidizing the, the people who are really <laughs> extracting value. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and one, by increasing annual fee, you know, they can capture value from those people and from everyone. Hmm. But then like they, by increasing the credits, even if they're hard to use, they can give people a cognitive way to justify it. So I think this coupon book approach is, you know, set. I mean, I really dislike parts of it, especially when it's like monthly and it's hard to use and it's like super specific, but sadly, I think it's inevitable because, it, you know, it has proven to be an effective, you know, thing for their marketing. So that's kind of my take on where things are going. Also, thank you, Joe. Great info and conversation. <laughs> I love that he mentioned his parents. <laughs> Appreciate you, Joe. Yeah, Joe's crazy. He was he did a live stream two weeks ago where he actually cut up his Amex Gold card and his Rose Gold. Oh, <laughs> just because he's had them for uh, I think I think longer than both of us have been on the planet. So <laughs> it's just like I'm finally done with it. <laughs> wow, he's, he's wild. But thank you so much, Joe. Appreciate <laughs> you coming. Thank in. you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Okay, so I also want to get into, so like you said earlier, isn't it funny, we kind of like bridge every yeah. gap. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit different than the BS podcast. Um, so, uh, so so, you mentioned, okay, so so being able to have all these multiplayer set up and, 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 and whatnot, and then eventually learning to optimize in the way of transferring these points out to, to travel partners. So how, I would say, what was like one of the first times you realize you realize the full power because you were you said you were watching videos and stuff and you saw people were doing it but what was like the first time that you were able to take your points Ooh. and do like a crazy thing with it and you're like wow is that really that like did, i just did that like did, did you ever have those moments mm. so i don't think it's the craziest redemption of them but we did a little trip to the midwest because i had an internship there two summers ago hmm. and we stayed a lot of it on high yeah and I think it really showed me how versatile Hyatt points were because mm. there were some Hyatt places that were 5,000 or 8,000 points. And I could do that, save it up. And then over the weekend, we would go to like Chicago downtown and, and splurge on a higher points property. And so really, you know, check out the different things. So, yeah, I think some people might get the impression that, oh, I'm just using my points for luxury things all the time. That's not the case. Sometimes I enjoy the value you get from you know a good solid category one or two Hyatt property. I mean, I still fly domestic economy Southwest all the time. I mm. haven't found the need or the value in flying, you know, domestic business or first class. I prefer to stay my my points for like a, a long haul. Mm. Like I mean, in terms of like the really cool redemptions, like I think I mean Etihad A three eighty the hmm. apartment was super nice uh and i oh. one of the reasons i got to do that was because i'm in that and sean's discord server and someone had dropped an alert that there was wide open availability uh, which hmm. is really hard to come by hmm. and that alert came out like a day before all the blocks started reporting on it so i was able to snatch three seats on one flight so for <laughs> myself my mom and my dad that was a really cool experience i mean there's other really good uh, Ventana Big Sur is such an amazing mm. redemption. It, I mean, it is pricey in terms of number of Hyatt points. Mm. You need typically 45,000 because it's Cat 8 high peak. And also hard to find availability. But yeah. man, it's like, I think uh, some people have said it's like the Maldives and forest. <laughs> I agree. I th- it's, it's also all inclusive now and the food is really great. Mm. Um, so, you know, that's a great high redemption. Also, I just happen to live close enough to it where it's like a two-ish hour drive. So it's perfect. I love that place. So a great redemption. I, I mean, I'll try to think of other examples, but um, it's also hard for me because I'm like a full-time student. So I feel like I don't have a lot of time hmm. to travel. I think 
at some point, you know, I think I've been telling people the challenge I find now is not that I don't have enough points, but that I don't have enough time to mm. spend them. Um, you know, I can really only go on breaks when I have that. Usually those are like peak travel times or things might be more expensive. So, you know, little disadvantage of my setup. But I'm like pretty happy with the things I've been able to experience uh, by getting into credit cards. Absolutely. Actually, Michael Levy said those tickets that you mentioned, I guess the Etihad tickets, $25,000 <laughs> tickets. Nuts. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, we booked with Air Canada Aeroplan. It was like oh. 65,000 points <laughs> for, first, for first class. That's wow. really amazing. It's really amazing redemption. Uh, sadly, I think it's harder to come by now because they've been playing games with their partner <laughs> availability. But um, if you can do it... Um, Perfect. And, you know, it's not like the, one of those things where like, oh, I need to keep doing this again. again. It's like, oh, I experienced mm -hmm. it. It's cool. And I understand this product is. Uh, but there are mm -hmm. just so many things to try. I'm not in a rush to go back to. It. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think I was <clears throat> I was listening to one of your. It might have just been the most recent one, the high devaluations um, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned like you were. Yeah, you did the Ventana. I think you said so, uh, like a high place in Taiwan. Um, there's a few other places mm -hmm. I, I forget. Um, but when, mm -hmm. when do you think you kind of, uh, cause I think this is like you and Sean, I remember in some, some episode, I, who knows when, um, you mentioned like you both have like a shared, like you somehow found out that you had a shared love of Hyatt or something like that. Or maybe you just said that today. I don't even know, but <laughs> I, mean, I think you did say that today. Um, when do you think you actually, uh, you know, when do you think you really developed this love for Hyatt hotels? Because it seems like you guys really yeah. push hard, hard with them. I mean, I think there are a number of factors why we like them so much. First of all, <clears throat> their award chart is amazing because they fix the number of points required per night hmm. um, for a particular property to like a category rather than Marriott Hilton IHG where they can just charge however many points they want on the dynamic pricing model. Yeah, Because right. of that, their points are frequently worth two if not three cents per point depending on the redemptions which mm -hmm. makes it an excellent <clears throat> excuse me opportunity to transfer chase points from and chase points are easy to earn if you can open a bunch of inks right so it's almost like this like it's high value yet not too hard to earn in terms of mm -hmm. the points um and i just think they have the most consistent elite recognition so sean and i both experienced globalist status and we strongly have the opinion that it's just not comparable to the other hotel chains. For example, Hyatt terms are very specific. If a standard suite is available, they must confer that to a globalist. Whereas mm. other hotel chains are pretty amorphous. Like you know, elite members may receive a room upgrade by the hotel's discretion, subject to availability, right? And I think there's a difference. Or uh, I mean their breakfast benefit is amazing like a lot of hotels will just let you order almost anything off the menu and not charge you anything for it for globals i've run up tabs that would have been 130 140 dollars oh for a breakfast <laughs> for two or three people and wow. you know, that's all wiped off I mean, they're consistent about honoring benefits 4 p.m late checkout examples really huge oh free parking on award nights for mm. globalists it's amazing i mean we were in cities where there is absolutely no parking. They only have valet, which is like eighty dollars a night, which is like insane. So then that's Jeez. a lot of value. And I just think they consistently deliver on benefits in a way that the other chains don't. Like for example, like Hilton is really nice because you can earn Diamond Status really easily with just by holding the Spire card. Mm. But because so many people have Diamond Status, I feel like the treatment is not as you know good as like high globalist or like marriott you know my feeling is they've expanded so quickly and acquired a bunch of brands that they're not mm. able to exercise top-down control quality control of like how those benefits mm. are offered. i mean sean and i recently recorded a whole it's out already a whole marriott hacks yeah. episode that was like nearly one hour long because of how complicated they make their program Jeez. so <clears throat> and and just just the inconsistency. Like, I feel like when I walk into Hyatt, I know what benefits to expect. I'm pretty mm. sure I'm going to get them. But there's a question mark about it with other brands that I 
don't feel with high end. So that's kind of my general take. Got it. Got it. Yeah. At least in my small experience so far, it seems to be it seems to be true. I'm excited to start getting a, a little bit more well traveled, and that's why I learned a lot from you guys. Uh, definitely pushing me more into the luxury yeah. side of things. Um, and also shout out because you you gave me a. Um, a Hyatt Club Lounge Award, so I appreciate you, sir. Mm. And uh, Sean gave me a, um, a guest of honor <laughs> award that I'm going to be using in Hawaii later this year. So that's a uh, shout out to you guys. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I love that Hyatt this year started allowing people to gift um, like yeah. awards to other people, which is really not. I mean, like Goldless uh, always had no use for those Club Lounge passes because you always get mm. Club Lounge access as a Goldless. So now that you can like gift it to people, I think that's yeah. pretty great. Definitely. Unfortunately, I still had a couple expire on me. You know, <laughs> oh no! A few days ago, but uh, it is what it is. Damn, nobody can use it. Ah, which another reason to join uh, Sean's Discord. Uh, sorry, yeah, the travel lane that you guys are both in. Yeah, um, you know, because you guys do offer them up every now and again. So very charitable. Yes. Um, I guess real quick because you guys just did just talk about it. Did, any like overarching thoughts on the recent Hyatt de devaluations? I know you guys did just an episode on it, but any quick things? Yeah, I think no doubt it is a devaluation. Hmm. Um, I think it is not as bad as it could have been. Like we didn't see them invent a new category nine for like Katana. So a lot of us were scared that was going to happen. Didn't happen. Hmm. Um, they're still keeping the war chart. They're not going dynamic, which is promising. Um, I would say it's a pretty big L for like all inclusives, Mexico, Caribbean. Those hmm. have gone up significantly, often without significant added value, frankly. Um, a pretty big L for major metropolitan cities in the US, hmm. like Boston, DC, Oahu, Hawaii, yeah. um, Chicago things have gone up but very interesting silver lining is there are some category drops particularly in california and asia now in california mm. i do think it's just a correction because things have mm. gone way too expensive in almost absurd ways um, without added value so mm. there's a bit of a correction there there's finally category four high in san francisco which is crazy has never mm. happened <laughs> Before. Really? Huh. Yeah, you would no unless you're talking about the Regency San Francisco Airport, which is not even in the center SF. All of the huh. high SF properties are category five, which meant you can't oh use God. a one through four certificate. Yeah. No, it's so expensive. And then so they finally dropped one of them down to four. So there's been a correction in California. Um and then also in Asia, you know, Japan, Taiwan, etc. Uh we've seen some of the categories come down, which is good. So say so yeah, it's a you know. Overall, still devaluation, but like a little more balanced than what we've seen in the previous two years devaluation. And that being mm. said, you know, they don't take until effect until the end of March. So if you want to book something that's about to go up, you can book it now, speculatively or not. They'll keep mm. the old pricing as long as you don't touch that reservation. So um, go look mm. into it. Gotcha. Yeah. As soon as that old came out, I was like, okay, where are all the places that I'm booking in the next like year? <laughs> <laughs> I just checked them all, and luckily none of them none of them were changing. So I was like, okay, cool. Okay, um, <laughs> which, <laughs> that's like, woo. Um, so that's that's good. Appreciate you, John. Um, and I want to see JP's in here. What's going on, um, Josh? What's going on, man? Yeah. So, okay, interesting. Okay, how was the uh, just from my own curiosity because Taiwan is a place I've been wanting to go to for a very long time. Um, May end up there in 2025. We'll see. I'm not sure. How would the Hyatt's Ooh, yeah. out there? You think? Yes, I think. Okay, as a disclaimer, I my parents are both from Taiwan. My family's from Taiwan. So I'm a little more familiar with it. Yeah. Um. How is it? I think a lot of the nice hotels in Taiwan are not affiliated with a big chain. Um, hmm. Oddly enough, so like. Really? I mean, there's some Marriott properties. There are very few Hyatt properties right now. I mean, type there's a Grand Hyatt Type A, which I think is pretty nice. It went from category four to three with this new change, oh. which is positive. Huh. Um, there's a Hyatt Place Type A, Xinzhuang, that I stay at, which is pretty nice. It is a, in a little farther location from the center mm -hmm. stuff, but they went from category two to one, hmm. which is, um, you know, 
again, a positive. So but I would say Hyatt does not really have a footprint in Taiwan. I think they're building a new Andaz in Park Hyatt next year in Taipei, which might be good. Oh. Um, but yeah, I would say Hi Hyatt doesn't really have a presence in Taiwan other than those two properties. I mean, even the Hyatt Place is very new, it opened last year or so. So hmm. I would say don't be afraid to, you know, go on a different travel portal and look at some of the local options in Taiwan. I mean, it, it's a great place. A lot of, you know, good food, lots to do. Um, can be really hot, though, if you go in the summer. But, huh. you know, highly recommend checking out. It's such a great place. They have really good airlines flying in hmm. and out. Um, Yuva Air is one of my favorite. And, hmm. yeah, highly recommend checking it out. Um, but I would say, like, Taiwan is not a place where a lot of the big hotel chains have a lot of property yeah gotcha maybe i'll hit you up when i uh, <laughs> when i go yeah i'll hit you up again um michael wong says i'll be staying in the grand hyatt in taiwan curious on your yeah it's a good property mm, okay. i personally haven't stayed there myself because like my grandparents live in taipei so it, like doesn't really make mm. sense for me to stay at a hotel in yeah. taipei for the most of the time but uh, i heard very good things about that property they have a club lounge uh, i think taiwan street noodles Yes, Taipei. Um, hmm. Cat One mattress run to Taiwan. Hey, man. That's an option. Uh, there's hey, man. actually um, <laughs> the Wild Palms Hotel in Sunnyvale, California, the Bay Area of all places, is dropping huh. from two to one starting next month. So there might be a a mattress run opportunity in our own backyard. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool yeah i want to go see the wind damper and the 101 and everything out there so yeah, yeah, yeah. i think that'll be fun um interesting okay cool uh is there any places that you have for when you eventually graduate that you want to go to and you have maybe a little bit more free time and whatnot mm. yeah it's hard because like once i graduate i might take yeah. the summer off we'll <laughs> see but then like i have to start work you know it's hard i, I have much less flexibility than just sean for example. Yeah, I know. He's, he's, he's over he there. He's just in Hong Kong like a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I remember um, I filmed with him and he was like, oh, I'll be gone next week. I'll be in Hong Kong. What are you doing? What are you doing, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I, I do want to go to Asia again this year. I have a really cool spring break trip planned coming up this hmm. month. Um, and I... Uh, let's see. I, I, there's a couple things on the book this month speculatively because of um of the Hyatt devaluations I kind of want to lock it in the old price yeah um Kalala Island which is a SLH Hyatt property um it's been on my mind I want to hopefully go later this year but we'll have to see if the timing works out hmm. um but yeah okay not bad um oh JP Knowledge says I'm missing type at the end of the year Starlux from Tokyo to type is 15k basket wow that's a really good price I've been debating between Hyatt Place and Grand Hyatt. Uh, I would say the Hyatt Place, I think the main disadvantage of it is the location. So it is a mm. little farther out from the main stuff in the city. It's still accessible via the MRT, but mm. in, I think the location is something you want to keep in mind if you choose to stay there. Um, Grand Hyatt is for Central. It's near the Taipei 101. Um, so, you know, I think, yeah, keep in mind location. But high place is a steal for the price. Let's see. Hmm. So actually, I'll, I'll continue on that too. Now I'm curious. If you, so like say I land there, uh, what do you recommend? Like, do you recommend like renting a, a motorcycle of some sorts? Um, like to get around? No, take whatnot? public transportation. If you're in Taipei, hmm. public transportation is very good. Um, MRT hmm. is amazing. Bus system, very hmm. robust. Um. Yeah, I don't recommend needing to drive for the most part if you're just hanging out in the city. Uh, their infrastructure is just something we don't have in the U.S. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. Um, any areas that you recommend that are like, or would you say stay close to Type A? I mean, if you're there for your first Type A, is great. Um, lots of good food. Lots to do. Uh, you could, I mean, there's also other parts of Taiwan that are really pretty. Like, you can check out um, you know, Hualien or mm. 
Kaohsiung. There's also Tainan, which is in the south. But, I mean, mm -hmm. there, there, there's a lot of stuff online you can find. Gotcha. But I'm happy gotcha. to give more specific recommendation. Gotcha. It's good, to later. <laughs> good to know. Um, JP said, thanks. I'm a fan of your podcast. Hell yeah. JP is oh, our you, other... Jim. He's our other residential uh, Thai loyalist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've seen some of his videos. They're great. <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh, what's going on, Lonnie and, and Cesar and JP Buffett? What's going on? We've got both JPs. Oh, my God. I never see you guys in the same place. It's almost like you're the same person. Weird. Um, <laughs> okay. Interesting. Now, I was watching one of your older uh, podcasts today, and uh, you said something that was interesting that is – it's something that's contrary to what's kind of been pushed a little bit more recently in, in the, the mm -hmm. general credit card space. And that is yeah. an air of simplicity. And, and by that, I mean people wanting to get maybe like, well, even in, in, your, in the case that you mentioned, U.S. Bank Altitude Reserve, maybe a Chase Sapphire Reserve to book for mm -hmm. 1.5 cents per point via yeah. the portals and whatnot. But I remember listening to you guys and you both were kind of against portals and booking through there. Uh, mm. Is there, but I think that was an old podcast. I don't, do you still kind of hold true? Like, would you rather not use portals if you don't have to? Yeah, I think there's a number of considerations. Well, first of all, I think one thing I hear frequently about the fear of complexity is I don't want to have relationships with too many banks because I have to keep track and forget whatever. Mm. And I think I don't agree with that because I think it's really important to diversify your points and not have all your eggs in one basket. Um, mm. You're like your transfer partners that Amex has that other people don't have, that mm. City has that other people don't have, and and that Chase has that other people don't have. I mean, I get the need to want to simplify, but I think you're you're just leaving money on the table by mm. only picking one or two issuers or ignoring some of them. Mm. Um, now, the point about portals is interesting. So I think what you're, what Anthony is alluding to is if you have to chase Sapphire Reserve, you can kind of redeem your points at a fixed 1.5 cents per point value um, for anything you book through the Chase travel portal. Um, I'm pretty averse to travel portals in the first place because they're like third party bookings. <clears throat> um, you know, you run into complications like hotels, for example, do not honor mm. a lead status if you yeah. book through portals, mm. right? Or <clears throat> if you have a problem with your flight, you might get bounced around customer service and the airline will say oh you need to talk to chase or portal and portal says you need to talk to the airline I think that's a it's a headache for everyone um but i i do I, I can see the appeal of the portal in that you know you, you don't need to stock a word availability because anything that can be booked for cash you can exchange points for but i don't know i i have the feel i think you should try to maximize your points with things you from which you can get outside value for because in my mind it's like this like if i can book something on the portal right and i'm going to spend the 1.5 cents per point on it i can i can either do that or i can pay cash mm. and i feel like i'd rather just pay cash for that thing and then save the points for something where i can get a lot higher value because i feel like i can make more cap make more money Mm. um in the long term so like you know those couple hundred dollars isn't going to meaningfully impact me that much in the long term but points are harder to come by like uh, you know even if you're going for sign up bonuses like crazy there i think there's a, a scarcity of the points that i would mm. not attribute to the scarcity of you know the cash in your bank account mm. and because of that I am not like a huge fan of the fixed cent per point redemptions because to me, mm. I'm just like, if it's a fixed cent per point, that's no different than taking money out of your bank account and paying for it. Because mm. again, like I'm also of the mentality that points are not free. Like, yes, the sign bonuses might feel free or whatever, but once those points hit your account, they now have a value to be used, right? So like once I earn those 75,000 points, even if I got them through a free means, like a sign up bonus, that's still seven hundred fifty dollars minimum value that can be cashed out. If I spend those seventy five thousand points on the redemption, I gave up the opportunity to cash them out at seven hundred fifty dollars. So to me, that is worth mm. um, a particularized value. And 
So I wouldn't say, oh, just because I got it for free, I can do a suboptimal redemption. It seems very irrational to me. It is the same hmm. logic as, oh, I got this bonus from work um, that is additional to my normal income, and therefore I'm going to spend hmm. it in a less than optimal way. No, it's still cash in your bank account. Uh, huh. So I, I I I kind of don't buy that argument. So I, I mean, if some of you might be able to tell, like Sean and I, have, like pretty opinionated takes on credit cards, and I understand like our strategy doesn't work or make sense for everyone, okay. but we do try to like explain our our logical rationale. Uh, <laughs> this is, uh, thank Mike you, Michael. Says, yeah, hundred percent on point. Must be studying economics. I am not an economist, actually. But thank you. <laughs> um, That's funny. Yeah. yeah I think uh, okay. Another mm -hmm. way to think about. It, let's say like you have a Sapphire preferred, right? And you can mm -hmm. cash out at one point two. Let's say you have a redemption that you can cash out for one point two five cents per point. Mm -hmm. Then you need, but instead of cashing that out at 1.25 cents per point for that redemption, I paid cash for that. And I saved my points for something more valuable, two or three cents per point later. Hmm. In effect, by using cash instead of the points on that redemption, you have purchased the points at 1.25 cents per point. Hmm. Now, most people would say, yes, I would buy Chase points at 1.25 cents per point. I would save so much money on Hmm. You know, I would save so much money on my highest states later on. Now, if you're willing to buy Chase points at 1.25 cents per point, point, you would do so by paying cash instead of redeeming the points for that thing. And if, you, if you're if you like, yes, I would pay 1.25 cents per point for a Chase point, rationally, it makes no sense for you to redeem for that thing instead of paying cash for it. That's another way to think about it. Interesting. Huh. So this leads me to a thought because... On certain videos, you get certain comments and, and they make you think a little bit. And it's something that I've I've thought about uh, in the last like couple of weeks. And it's something we actually talked about. Uh, people don't know yet, um, but we actually did a uh, podcast together. I went on the BS podcast, which will come out at some point. But that was a fun conversation. But I think there was a very small part in it, which I kind of want to expand a little, that I mentioned. Yeah. Um, I mentioned something like, what is the goal <laughs> for the points of miles game at the end of the day? Mm. Because I see, I understand, like I see what you're saying, your point of view is, you know, I, I could just pay cash and that's effectively buying at 1.25, something like that. And that's my value that I'm ascribing to it because I did redo the redemption. That could have been money in my bank account, something like that. Um, but I also remember like starting out in the game and I remember like going to these like low end Hiltons and stuff like that. And I just remember like, wow, we're paying cash. Like we, we're not paying any cash. There's nothing out of pocket. We're just paying with points. So I, I try to remember like back in the day and then what it is today like what is the what is the goal of the points of miles game in, in in the first place is it to maximize your life as, as much as possible maximize your points to the nth degree or is it just so i can pay nothing out of pocket now if you asked me when i first got started it was the first answer as you ask me now i'm getting closer to like that you know the second answer where it's right like maximize so what what do you think just being in this game from beginning to end what is the goal of the points of miles game for someone's life you know anthony i think <laughs> the the more you study the topic the the charm of getting something free start sort of starts to dissipate. Mm. Uh, let me explain what I mean by that. It's like, <laughs> like, like, yes, you know, when you spend points, you are not spending cash on something. Uh, like, I, th that is true. Mm -hmm. For me, the value of points and miles is to be able to experience certain mm. things that are way outside of what I could reasonably afford or justify spending money on and that those are like cool um you know irreplaceable experiences i think that, and that is what i value and i think i've now adopted this strong opinion that points are not free you know once you know yeah yes the sign up bonus might have been free in some sense but once those points hit your account they could have been cashed out for something yeah. and by choosing not to cash them out using it for another thing, you gave up an opportunity to put more cash in your bank account, therefore you paid something for it, okay? So mm -hmm. under that understanding, yeah, I think it's more about optimizing. Mm -hmm. now, at least for me, about like 
trying to do the coolest things I can with my points and and not just like use like I get I mean I get like it's cool you can substitute stuff you can like save a lot of money on travel by not hmm. paying cash and using points but then to me yeah. it's like I don't know the points themselves are sort of like a different currency so it doesn't it's not free in that sense <laughs> I don't know it's it, it's a very deep philosophical <laughs> mm-hmm. thing um well also see, yeah uh-huh. i think the value of points is to travel better and stay places that you couldn't afford or want to pay for that is true i mean another thing people bring up is like oh you know these really expensive things that you're doing with these points are not what you would pay for in the first place therefore you can't value it at that high i hate that so much that's her i point. hate that I, I think there's some Ugh. you know there's some truth to it but i think that argument confuses value with savings like yes. my savings might be lower because i wouldn't have paid that much for it but I, it doesn't detract from the value of what you get it is you mm-hmm. know what people paying cash are really paying for it so yeah yeah, yeah I, I that's my one hot take anthony doesn't have too many hot takes i kind of just take wisdom <laughs> from everybody but my one hot take is when i see a comment like oh you wouldn't have booked that i don't know no one said this but i'll just say it. like you, you couldn't have booked that because i just booked the waldorf story in dc with like fhr and stuff like wow. that they're like you would <laughs> thanks they're like you wouldn't have booked that otherwise so you can't value that like that credit that fhr credit whatever and i'm like yes but i also wouldn't have that experience i would be less happy right. as a result. i hate the idea and i love that you just mentioned like it's the difference between value and savings it's like yeah i get it i could just be staying in budget hotels the rest of my life sure that's fine and i would have a lot of points to do so but i also want to experience some crazy stuff also so it's like i think yeah. i can value both uh, you know, I think mm-hmm. there's a degree. Like, I put a community post. I was gonna buy these Versace slippers on Saks on Fifth. I never. I, wow. People were like, "That's manufactured spend." I said, "I get it." I said, "But it's how funny would it be to have Versace slippers from Saks because they were like oh, discounted by eighty percent." Saks credit is so funny, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I'm not valuing it anymore. But over the years, I've got like dress shirts and stuff from Saks that I was gonna buy for like real okay. estate and stuff. So I was like, I could have valued it. Nice. I, I have valued it, but now I I don't. Because I think I have everything from yeah. Saks I can want. Um, and John says, I hate that argument. It's stupid. If you pay cash for a stay someplace and got benefits like FHR, that is value. Yeah. I think so. You know, it's like you wouldn't have booked it other way, bro. Like, of course, I don't, yeah. you ain't got money like that. But I'm um, experiencing it anyway. You know? So yeah. that's. I especially love of. FHR in like places like Las Vegas. I mean, the options are not as good mm-hmm. as it used to be because a lot of properties left. But like, Sometimes the room rates are sub two hundred, and you still get the hundred dollar food and beverage credit, the sixty dollar yeah. breakfast, so, mm-hmm. and you can use the Amex Platinum hotel credit. So it's so much value right there. It's funny. I actually asked Sean when he was on his opinion on mm-hmm. just cashing out your points via Schwab, like a one point one cent per mm. point, and using that to pay cash for FHR stays because you have to bake mm. in the one sixty in value. Yeah, and he he basically just told me he was like. Well, it's okay, but you know, I could probably get way better than <laughs> I could get way better value. Yeah. Than all of that combined, you know, with with transferring it. So I'm assuming you would have maybe a similar mindset on that. Yeah, I think he's right. I think the only I think the only like hotel points worth transferring to is Hyatt. Because like I G Merritt Hilton. I mean, even with the Amex one to two Hilton doesn't doesn't really make sense considering yeah. how much more value you can get with other stuff. And then for FHR, it's like fixed one cent per point, which I'm not a fan of. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Makes but sense. I mean, if you had to cash out, <laughs> yes, doing shop as well. for 1.1 1. 1 <laughs> as opposed to one is better, but they're just better option. In my for view. sure. Um, how about for you personally, uh, kind of on the topic of, you know, value and experiences and stuff like that, you've kind of talked about it, but maybe if I just ask you directly, how do you think points and miles has like changed your life in a way as a loaded question? Mm. <clears throat> I think I, yeah, I've developed reputation among my friends for being a crazy credit card optimizer when I see how oh. many cards I have. Yeah. Um, so it's pretty fun. I think, I think it's encouraged me to like travel and experience more things that would have previously, cause there's like a fun, L- I mean, like, the travel being amazing aside, there's like a fun element of you know optimizing. Oh, like I'm getting so much value yes. and not having to pay money for it. You know, and there's like a joy to that. I think 
myself. But, you know, it's also encouraged me to take trips that I otherwise wouldn't have, hmm. you know, it would have crossed my mind. Um, so, you know, that's really cool. Um, yeah, I think, again, it's more about, I mean, at least at you know, my station, like, it's more about unlocking these cool experiences that I otherwise wouldn't be able to do rather than just like strictly about saving money. But you, yes, yeah, so you do need to have good financial habits before you can do this stuff. Because, uh, yeah, for sure. I agreed as well. Um, Keith asks, yeah, sure. And do your parents go for bank account bonuses too? Hmm. Sometimes. Um, I think I do it more than my parents. Like if there's like a big five to seven hundred dollar bonus, I might do it. Hmm. I mean, setting up the deposits or whatever is a little annoying, but I, you know, it's, if it's free money, why leave it on the table? I do keep in mind that bank bonuses are usually taxed as interest income, unlike hmm. credit card bonuses, which are considered rebates for non taxable. So, yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, I also wanted to ask, uh, it's actually someone commented this earlier and I was saving it in my head because I thought it was a great question in the live chat. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I forget who it was. It was like a, a darker, uh, um, profile picture. They asked, uh, <laughs> what do you and Sean disagree about? I think a lot of you guys, I think you agree on like, all things. Is there anything you disagree on? Okay. I think his food tastes are really bland, oh. but He's vegetarian, so what can you do? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I think we actually have very different modes of travel. He's the type of person that can sit in a relaxing you know, beach resort for four, mm. five nights and just chill out. I can't. Uh, I want to have activities. I want to be checking out local things. Um, you know, I'm more like, I will get like really bored if I just stay at a resort mm. for three nights and not do anything, <laughs> but um, he enjoys that. That's great. What else? I am fine with Southwest, even though they're, he really hates their like boarding system, which mm. I kind of agree with, but I still think there's so many positives about the airline, like not having to pay for check bags or um, you know, being able to cancel and receive credit that doesn't expire. It just really works for me. I, again, I don't, mind flying domestic economy um, it. Boo, Southwest. <laughs> oh the perfect time yeah. <laughs> hi sean I'm glad you're here um, Sean late everybody <laughs> so. i mean sean had the the companion pass for quite a while and he still hates it uh -oh. but i i mean it, it's also an easy way for me to extract like the airline credits from the amex cards so gotcha um Anything else? Yeah. I mean, there might be other things. Those are just some that things so I have on top of my mind. Yeah. <laughs> that is so funny because me and uh, Calby, who's also uh, another uh, credit card YouTuber, mm -hmm. we're like, you know, best friends pretty much. And, uh, and he, uh, he, we're very like I'm Sean. Basically, <laughs> I like to sit on the beach. I barely eat any types of foods, and mm. all he does, he'll give me an entire travel itinerary, like six a.m. to to six p.m. and then maybe oh, yeah, just like yeah. an hour for in between. Like, do you do that too? Do you have entire itineraries of what you're gonna do? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very type A <laughs> okay. about like scheduling. <laughs> To be honest, <laughs> I'm. I think there's pros. I'm not saying it's the only way to. Do, uh, there's pros and cons to yeah. you know different modes of traveling. I, you know, sometimes I will go to a destination just to relax at the resort. Hmm. Other times I'm there at a destination to really explore the area to learn about it. Then you know I don't have to book the mo the fanciest hotel. I'm not spending that much time. So it, you know, I'm pretty open to different types of experience. I want to put you. I want to put you on a real. Uh deserted area put you honestly just put you right in the Maldives where it's like aren't you like in the middle of the ocean or something and it's like I think yeah, it's like you gotta do at least eight <laughs> nights in the Maldives and, you would never yeah, you'd feel like this is boring I, man <laughs> yeah I, I would try it but I, I don't know that'd be, that'd <laughs> be a real it, test but... that's funny <laughs> Taipei yeah. Taipei yeah that's a good <laughs> <laughs> Jesus yeah. um I also wanted to ask a little bit about um uh, Stanford a little bit because I'm curious because I never I never was able to 
I never made it to those kind of levels. Like, uh, you know, I wasn't that smart. <laughs> Still not that smart, obviously. Um, I dropped out. Didn't really get to those high end levels. So, so what's the deal with with Stanford? So, I when I hear Stanford, my first thought is it's a high level school. That's all I really think of. It's a high level school, and I, I don't really know why. Is, is is that correct? Is it a high level school? Is it hard to get into? I mean, it's, I think their admissions are certainly competitive. Um, hmm. Sure, I mean, it, you know, it is hard to get into. I would say, I feel like in a way, the hard part about Stanford is getting in. And then afterward, like, the grading, for example, is pretty generous compared to, oh. like, the school that Sean went to, UC Berkeley. <laughs> so there's less trust. Um, there's this phrase you'll hear thrown around you know, called duck syndrome. And hmm. it's the idea that, you know, ducks on the surface seem like they're gliding on the water peacefully. Uh, but, you know, beneath, beneath the surface, they're paddling furiously. <laughs> and that sort of characterizes a standard student. Where, you know, it seems calm and chill on the surface, but we're working our butts off uh, in reality. So, I mean, wow. that's the thing I think I, there's some truth to. I would say, like, um, yeah, it, it's a pretty unique experience. Like, you get to meet a lot of cool, accomplished people. So it's more about the people. I, I mean, I think in terms of the quality of instruction, I wouldn't say it's that many leagues beyond other really good universities. Hmm. Um, but it's more like the opportunities you get from attending events or meeting people. That's pretty cool. Hmm. Is there anything, anything else specific you're wondering? Yeah. Well, actually, Josh Gable came in. He said it's a 3.7% acceptance rate. Yeah. Wow. So what would be the requirements? Like, I remember <laughs> I remember when I went to a, a community college in New York, uh, all that was required was a letter of just, just writing a letter mm. to get in there. And uh, I think what I did was I just literally put on voice to text and I just talked it out. Mm -hmm. And then I fixed the grammar and sent it and I got accepted. Didn't care what my <laughs> nice. grades were. Didn't care what my, you know, that I was basically in, in the 65, you know, 70 range for all my classes in high school, stuff like that. Didn't care, just got in. I'm guessing to get into Stanford is a little different. Yes, I think, I think the hard part is actually it's not sufficient to just have like good grades or, hmm. or like strong test scores. Um, they practice, as many universities do, holistic admissions where it's a combination of you know, essays, test scores grades, letters of recommendation, like just how they view you wow. as like your personality from your, your profile. So it's, hmm. I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty arbitrary. I, I wouldn't say like the people who got into Stanford are, you know, different from some objective measure as opposed to people who didn't get into Stanford. It's, hmm. it's still a college admission, still a crapshoot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I would say it's more holistic than just... That's pretty crazy. Grades or whatever. Yeah. So these letters of recommendation, are they coming from teachers from your high school or yeah. other places? Like your yeah. mom can't write you a letter of recommendation. Yeah, they usually guess. won't like give much weight to recommendations from like family members. Yeah. <laughs> He's a great yeah, kid. So. <laughs> it's a great yeah, kid. But, wow. Um, hmm. But I, I also think, I mean... You know, it's cool, but it's not the end all be all because, like, there are just so many opportunities everywhere. Like, a lot, a lot of here's what else. Like, if if going to Stanford is like your only personality <laughs> or on, only personality trait, that's not that's not really meaningful in the long run. I wouldn't like idolize it or something. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And I'm just personally curious because I, I like to know mm -hmm. about all these types of things. It's funny, yeah. Yeah, the only mention that you guys have at the beginning, <laughs> the only mention you guys have of the schools is like, this is the BS podcast. Um, I remember, I don't know if you do it anymore, but in the past you said like, we set our differences aside. To, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sort of a joke because like Cal and Stanford are rivals. Um, mm. I mean, there's like tradition, like the big game, like football game is like a tradition. Uh. Right. I mean, our football team's not doing really good well right now oh really <laughs> but no we have not won a game against cal since like my time at camp <laughs> oh wow but um yeah josh yeah. says go uw oh wow um Networking he says can get yeah. you fun like it's true do you think so 
for Stanford? Is it like a networking with the people that you're going to school with or the people that you I would say like, so I'm personally not that good at networking. It's like something I would like to improve, but um, hmm. Stanford has a big like startup culture. Like you will notice like, a hmm. lot of people meet people at Stanford and start companies. Uh, wow. And that's not really the space I'm in, but I, I know it's a big thing huh. um, at my school. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's always such a, a crazy world to me. You know, to, I, uh, what about, is it like, is that dorming as well? Or you can or you, you mean, cannot? Like, do you, is that a place where you like only dorm or you can just drive there? If yeah, you I'd say uh, mo most students live on camp, like 97% or something. Students live on campus wow. all four years. It's sort of like an, un unlike a college town, it's sort of like an isolated campus. I mean, it's, it's beautiful and nice, but it's, oh. it is isolated. So yeah it may, like most people do live on campus as opposed to like you know commute or have your own place at least for undergrads i mean hmm. grad students it's more common to have off campus hmm. housing so yeah and I, I like that analogy you said earlier uh just about the duck and you know it seems like it's gliding is that really like is it like from day one when you when you i guess get admitted and you, you start your classes is it like just a crazy amount of workload you know between all your classes uh, i mean it is a fast-paced school because we are on the quarter system so each term is only 10 weeks and then finals oh. so like basically if you fall behind you're really screwed because they mm. don't have time for review there's no time for ideas to really marinate in your head it's just <laughs> go 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 week one and week ten like you're gonna have midterm starting like week three or four Wow. just because of how compressed the time is. so yeah and salute to you man that's uh like i can imagine <laughs> personally that's that's wild um and, and you said off camera you, you're kind of in the computer science um field yeah so i study um my undergrads in symbolic systems so it's like this unique thing at stanford where it's a combination of computer science psychology philosophy and cognitive science i think the general oh. theme is um, like what is a relationship between the mind and the machine? Um, I mean, which really? just translates to I mean, most people just end up doing AI or software yeah. Yeah. afterward. Um, but then huh. I'm also doing co-term in computer science. What was the first one? So, co-term? A co-term co is, oh. um, you can do like a master's degree at the same time. Oh, wow. So are you, you're doing your master's? So oh, wow. I'm doing hmm. both same time. Yeah, it's nice because <laughs> I can save time and money by do but it, it is a lot more workload because of this, hmm. but I've been able to manage so far. <laughs> is that is that something where you have to do like um isn't there like a final like a final thing you have to I, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of, or is oh, that like, like a, a thesis? A thesis, yeah. Is that yeah something the Stanford do? MSCS program actually is just like you take classes there's not uh, i mean you can do research or or dissertate but it's actually not required which is pretty nice but hmm. different schools have different requirements programs gotcha um john said networking is big i have gotten some side jobs coming up because of networking and through my best friend doing some cybersecurity consulting with the last Ooh, with, nice. the, with a few last firms yeah he's a cybersecurity person i don't know what you would call it but yeah, he's, he's he's protecting us out there uh, yeah <laughs> um, that's okay. cool I, I took a few classes on cybersecurity and it, oh. it's like oh, it's a whole thing <laughs> i don't so, know that much about it but, can i ask yeah. you then what because uh, again it, it, talking to somebody who has no experience so <laughs> i'm sorry if these are like you know basic questions but but why is it that because we were talking off camera about just um just how much uh competition there is in the computer science field uh have you personally seen that like just a rise of just everybody's doing you know computer science and it is is it really just the the same push we see on the outside like okay we have self-driving cars nvidia you know ai chips stuff like that is is it really just the the entire move of everyone going to mm. ai and security uh, I would say, I mean, computer science is very popular at my school. People see us like, because 
I would say generally it's among the highest paying majors, like out of college, for example, right? So it's popular. Hmm. Right now there is a tech recession where it's like really hard for new grads to find jobs. Hmm. Um, I've experienced this myself. Many of my friends have experienced it. I mean, companies were hiring like crazy back in like 2018 or whatever. Hmm. And now they've slowed down um, because of economic conditions. Yeah. So it's, um, it's really... You know, it's it's tougher for CS people right now. I mean, I know so many people who are like, you know, pre med or whatever, and then they go to Stanford and then they become CS after a year. <laughs> it's kind of a, a a very typical pivot, but yeah, I would say uh, it's a bit harder to find a job like compared. To, you know, if I graduated two or three years ago, things would have been much easier. <laughs> should, should, you should uh, be upset with your parents. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they should have had me earlier. No, it's 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 pretty wild. That is pretty wild. Um, I also wanted to get into some. Um, well, of course, anybody in the live chat, but also community posts and Discord questions, if you want to. Um, unless you did, you have anything you wanted to bring up before getting into those questions at all? No, go for it. Gotcha. Go for it. Um, okay, so sometimes we have fun questions. Sometimes we don't. Um, let me see. What do we have here? What's the most interesting? So actually, um, Keith asks kind of more on the topic we were kind of just into before Stanford. So I guess that works. Keith asked you, uh, who's also in the chat, he said, with all the loyalty programs devaluations these past 12 months, Delta, Virgin, United, AA, Turkish, Hyatt, where do you still see the sweet spot for redemptions, you think? Hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, I think devaluations are discouraging, but they're inevitable. It just means we need to change mm -hmm. and adapt our strategies, right? I think that's the best way to move forward. Um, I think, I'll, I will admit I'm not as familiar in detail with like the airline side mm -hmm. of things. Um, like, I, like I don't chase like airline elite status or whatever. I know like Delta has made it almost impossible because they're trying to weed out people from the ranks. Um, I think there are still sweet spots in, like, for example, airlines. You just need to find the award charts with the really nice redemption rates. Like, for example, I think ANA recently announced a devaluation, but it's still hmm. like, and it's crazy, like, they've increased however many percent, but it's still cheaper than all the other partners. Um, really? in star alliance for some of these routes yeah i mean we're looking at just only a little above hundred thousand round trip from like us to japan or asia for business wow. class round trip i mean really uh, most places charge at least seventy five thousand in one way for huh. business class so i mean there's still um you know there are still sweet spots that can be taken advantage of Hotels, I would say it depends. Like, I think, yes, the Hyatt devaluation is, you know, it's not a positive thing, but it's still possible to get very good value on both low end, mid end, high end. For for Hilton, for example, I mean, their points have been worth very little for a while now, but, you know, their redemptions are still really good at the very high end luxury properties. Mm -hmm. If you use free night certificates, you can book them. Um, you can use points fifth night free. So, you know, I think you just got to come into this game of mindset of, of allowing the change and adaptation to happen. Like the evaluations are inevitable. And that's also why, you know, I personally am a hypocrite because I'm not very good at this, but like you should be trying to burn your points and not just hoard them. Hmm. Like points cannot be your like retirement travel plan, <laughs> right? Because they're, they're just going to keep devaluing. So it's kind of like a use it or lose it hmm. keep burning it kind of situation gotcha um actually a live question tim watts what's going on tim he said i'm a 1099 employee traveling sales rep responsible for all expenses drive over fifty thousand miles a year and over 130 nights in hotels a year i pay all expenses best hotel and gas cards wow that's pretty wild best hotel. okay gas card check out the wyndham business card from barclays i think this is very underrated card so the Wyndham business card earns mm. 8x points on camp on all gas purchases now you know 
I'm not like a big Wyndham property fan or anything, but they have a sweet spot where they can, um, um, these points can be used at the cost of vacation mm -hmm. rentals at a fixed 15,000 points per bedroom per night. And you can get a great outside value on those stays. Uh, Wyndham also has a very neat partnership with Caesars where Wyndham mm. business card gives you Wyndham diamond and can match mm. to Caesars diamond. Um, so if you like Vegas, for example, you can get way for resort fees, which are huge in Vegas. Mm. Um, you can get a hundred dollar celebration dinner credit each year from Caesars diamond oh. um, discounts. You can skip lines at certain buffets. Very good card. It has a ninety-five dollar mm. annual fee, but each year they automatically give you fifteen thousand points. Easily pays for it. self gas. Oh. Um, if you're looking for more transferable type currency card, uh, let's see, fifty thousand miles per year. Wow. Um, Amex Business Gold might be a good option. You know, it has pretty high annual fee, but you know, earning four mm. X on gas could be really useful for you. Um, also recommend looking into the city premier. The city premier earns three X uncapped transferable points on hmm. gas spend. And finally, this one is not really talked about, but what about the Hyatt business card? The Hyatt business card um, earns two X points on your top three categories. I think every quarter, I think gas is one of them. The Hyatt hmm. points are worth a lot. Um, they can be worth usually two, three cents per point, depending on what you're redeemed for. So earning two X back on that is great, but that's not why I would get the Hyatt business card. If you have high spend in the Hyatt business card, you have five elite night credits for every $10,000 in spend, which means you can get to globalist um, hmm. or, or um, just by spend alone or through a combination of spend and stay. So th th those are some options I would look into. Huh. Um, yes. Interesting. Huh. So could you, I mean, yeah, yeah. Could you stack like the, just the personal world of Hyatt, get Discoverist, and does that matter, actually? actually and does that matter? Well, Discoverist? okay, so that the Discoverist itself doesn't bring you closer to Globalist, but oh, if you man. have the hmm. personal Hyatt credit card, just by having a card, each year you get five Elite Night credits. So that brings... You from if you're try, assuming you're trying to get globalist, which is 69, so that brings you yeah. down to 55. Yeah. Right. So then you'd only need to spend what is it, ten thousand dollars, eleven times, um, on the business card to get toward oh. get globalist without stepping a foot in the high <laughs> house. Damn, one hundred ten. Um, so I mean, it's a lot of spend, but for some people, you know, this might be the easiest way yeah. to get the best hotel status in the industry, in my opinion. Yeah, honestly, uh, Keith is somebody that could easily uh, actually do that with his uh, with his business for sure. Um, Seventy five k sub. Yeah, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Interesting. I, I like the little tip there about Caesar's Wyndham because I was at Caesar's recently. And I, I like the buffet. He said mm -hmm. skip the lines. That line was pretty long. I was at the Bacchanal buffet <laughs> in Caesar's Palace. Oh Maybe yeah, Caesar's I right? once bypassed that line. I was like two hours. <laughs> By having Caesar's diamond. So, really? Yeah. How do you? Hey, wait. Yeah. How do you present that? So do you just walk to the front. And There's like, another line diamond. that says "diamond member." That's what that line was. Yeah. Oh yeah. wow! No, honestly, the amount of money you would have to gamble <sighs> in order to earn Caesar's diamond organically is pretty insane. So, is it? being hmm. able to do the Wyndham match over is such a such a boon. I mean, you can also use the hundred dollar celebration dinner at Bacchanal. Oh, I might have to. Oh, man, I might have to get that just for that. You, that you get on it. Sick, oh, man. I love the Bacchanal. <laughs> yeah, that was great. It was funny. I actually just got married at that point. I got married in Vegas and literally oh, wow, went congrats. straight to the Bacchanal buffet with a bunch of other oh, nice um, credit card people. It was great. It, it was so funny. If you like oh. buffet, the other one I recommend checking out is it's a little off the strip, so you might have to Uber there or something, but it's called hmm. uh, the All You Can Eat Out uh, uh, Wild Palms. They have. Hmm. On I think like Wednesdays and Thursdays they have like oh you can lobster and crab and hmm. yeah it's really good and yeah um, yeah highly recommend checking sometimes you have to go a little off the strip to find like a really good deal gotcha they, Matt Clawson stuff to entice people and yeah makes sense Matt Clawson says Caesar's ended its relationship with the founders card and he thinks that mm. may translate over to the window yeah I mean mm. hopefully we're 
or at least good for another year. Cause I just got, um, so the seizures year ends in every January. I just got my thing renewed again till February, uh, till January, 2025. So hopefully we're at least good for another year. Oh, wow. Hmm. Something yeah, to think about for sure. Time. The hmm. MGM ended its relationship with Hyatt, which was a huge loss. For my so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm also hoping it lasts, but we'll see. We'll have to see what happens in, adapt gotcha um michael wong he well michael wong x just so i have it in here he said have you flown award flights business economy what's your best experience i think you mentioned that that etihad was pretty good well it was a good uh redemption that you found i guess maybe what was your favorite flight or did you have like any crazy flights uh, i mean that was definitely the coolest experience etihad a380 mm. apartments i've also flown uh since I go to Taiwan pretty frequently, my family's uh, Eva Air business class is mm. nice. Um, my parents just came back to Taiwan recently, and I booked them on the new Starlux business class, which they enjoyed. Mm. Taiwan has a really good airline. I think they have good service as well. Really? Um, hmm. But yeah, I actually, there. I mean, Sean has been a lot on a lot more like cool airline products that I've yet to try. So I think that's a better gotcha. question for him. I'm cool. more focused on like the hotel stuff at the moment. Too. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay, cool. Interesting. Um, let me see here. Okay. So then what about, Hmm. Okay. I actually, you actually got some good questions here. Um, what about, uh, for Mr. Mr. Chris D he wanted to know, so what's the best way to use Hilton points? The value and redemption seem harder and harder to find, which... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so for Hilton points, the first thing you want to keep in mind is they're worth like less than a cent per piece, typically. Mm. So you don't want to transfer your American Express points over because those are, can be worth a lot more. Even at a one to two ratio, it's not really worth it. Um, however, you can buy Hilton points at half a cent per point when they're on sale. So that may be good. I wouldn't go out buying them speculatively, but sometimes if you have a particular redemption in mind and it's cheaper to buy the points for it rather than book it directly, that is a strategy you should consider. Mm-hmm. In general, the best value for Hilton points can be found at the high end properties. So things costing 80, 90, 100, 120,000 points per night. Mm-hmm. Um, because when you're up at that high level, you can get pretty close to one cent per point, if not more. Whereas on the normal sort of mid-tier hotels, you're only averaging around 0. 0.4, 0. 0.5 cents per point. It's honestly really sad how much they've devalued. Um, but so that would be my recommendation, like look into the high end. I recently went to the Waldorf Astoria in Los Cabos. Hmm. using a free night certificate that was amazing i'm now convinced there's no other good use case for that free night certificate in, in north america because it was just that good so um look for the aspirational exemptions is what i'm saying otherwise i mean it's fine if you redeem for other stuff but i think about as you correctly you know mentioned that the value can be mediocre at times, definitely. Like you said, yeah, the higher end ones. Oh yes, yeah, Keith be... mentioned use fifth night free for points days. That is very yeah. true. I mean, actually, that's the reason I've struggled to redeem my Hilton points because I need to find a good. <laughs> you need someone that has so many nights. things to do. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, Hilton points are easy to earn and hard to burn, as I'd say. Huh. Yeah. Easy to earn, hard to burn. I like that. Huh. Yeah. That's good. That's a good point. Yeah. For sure. Um. That's funny. Huh. I also want to ask too. You, you um, like you, you mentioned parents uh, from Taiwan and stuff. And do you do you speak uh, Mandarin? Yes. Hell yeah, man. I'm mostly speaking at home. Yeah. Well, well uh, yeah, English well, is still my primary yeah. language, though. Okay. I, huh? <laughs> well, well, yeah, <laughs> which one? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> well, the Tong and the Pongyo. <laughs> well, Taiwan and the Pongyo. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. Can... Share it's only. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, nice. Oh, nice. Oh, 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 o
一个秘密。<笑>我最喜欢的 Jody 是 Hyatt。Oh, nice! <笑> Ridiculous. That's my favorite hotel. Don't tell the people. <笑> oh, sorry. <笑> Don't tell the people. Right. We we should right, do a classified. we should do a, a Chinese podcast one day. Just all Chinese.、Uh, I feel like that would、Chinese、be a good market. Kai Yue. Kai Yue. Kai Yue. Kai Yue. Oh, interesting. Good to know. Hmm. Um, that's funny. I feel like we have to capture the audience though. We want to hit. We want to hit. <laughs> we gotta hit them.、Um, so, also another question here, which is best credit card for paying taxes.、Um, I'll be doing that very soon. I have twenty plus、mm. different credit cards,、uh, which everyone has eyes. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I would say、um, it could be depending on your tax liability. It could be a good opportunity to hit a, a welcome bonus.、Um, hmm. Especially since the fee isn't super high, I would say like any like two X earning card you would come out ahead because the fee is like what one point eight something depending on the processor. Yeah. yeah. So like for example, if you put it on the Blue Business Plus or two X membership rewards points,、hmm. um, you'd be buying effectively one MR at a little less than a cent each,、yeah. which is pretty worth it, in my opinion. Gotcha. Yeah.、Um, my... You could also do VentureX or City Double Cash. They are two X points. Gotcha. I think over the years I've done it on. Well, I don't think I'll have anything this year. Otherwise, I would have put my ink、uh, to pay for it. My ink、mm-hmm. uh, unlimited that I just I have like another fifteen hundred spend.、Um, in、oh, the okay. past, okay. I, actually, I think last year I used my platinum card because I had a retention offer. I think it was like oh okay points, something like that. And、it was like forty thousand points, and I was like, "I'm just gonna pay taxes with the five of them, and get that get that retention." Yeah, 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 makes sense. Makes sense.、Um, and I think just two more,、uh, which is、uh, Joe Bretto, who came in earlier, who said,、uh, "Thank you for mentioning your parents." They did that super chat.、Um, he said, "Is it worth getting the Is it worth getting the platinum status for Marriott? I have gold and the business card as well. Should I upgrade?" Hmm. hmm. Upgrade. Upgrade well, what? Oh,、uh, sorry. I, I guess he means upgrade to because he's got gold elite set. So I guess he wants to. Should I go I upgrade、see. to platinum status? I would say the only way you should earn platinum status is by getting the Bonvoy Brilliant card from Amex.、Um, otherwise, to earn、hmm. like the elite knights to get there is like a lot more difficult. So that the Brilliant card does have a six fifty annual fee, which is pretty steep. Yeah, but it confers automatic platinum elite status. Uh, it does have a three hundred dollar annual dining credit broken up into months, twenty five dollars per month. But so that、yeah. can kind of subsidize it. But and it comes with an eighty five k certificate, which is pretty valuable.、Um, I'd say the main difference between platinum and gold is that you'll start to see more meaningful upgrades、hmm. uh, because you know everyone and their mother is gold from the platinum yeah, card. So、right. you know. I mean, even platinum is not that hard to get anymore because you can just get it with the credit card. I think that yeah, main perks are platinum. You get like lounge access at certain properties,、mm-hmm. or free breakfast at many properties, subject to like fifteen different asterisks and exceptions、um, <laughs> that I cover in my podcast because、yeah. it's, it's a really complicated program. But、mm-hmm. like, you will get better upgrades. I mean, it depends. Like, if you see yourself staying at like Marriotts somewhat frequently. Could be worth going for platinum. I I do think the benefits at platinum are pretty legit in a way that the benefits at gold are not.、Um, and additionally, also keep in mind if you get the Bonvoy Brilliant, it may lock you out of signing bonuses from the Chase Merit cards because they have、mm. like these really weird rules where you can kind of only go down one path every two years or so.、Yeah. So keep. Good to know. Good to know. And then the. L- Wait, are we back? Oh, we're back. Oh, okay. hello. Okay, we're back. <laughs> yes, okay. I was like, I saw myself for a second. I was like, I'm alone.、Um, and then the last question from Kid Cat, great guy.、Um, his third question we actually answered already,、um, and I'll just go with the. I'll go with actually the first one because it's on the same exact topic. He said, based on the current merit landscape and elevated subs. Um, what co-branded cards would you recommend for someone looking to hit titanium? And he currently has the business card.、Hmm. Okay, so I think if I recall correct, Marriott's not my primary program.、So、yeah, I need to refresh my memory a little bit. But、Same. if you have the brilliant card, 
Mm-hmm. That gives you 25 elite knights automatically each year mm-hmm. and platinum status. And then it only stacks with the business card, not any other personal cards. The business card will give you 15. So that'll bring you to like 40 knights. I think I need to check the math on it. And then you can just do the rest of the nights to get to titanium, which I think requires 75 nights. Hmm. So that, that is sure. the best shortcut I'm familiar with. So get the brilliant and then get the business card, those EQ and stack, and then make hmm. up the difference, get to titanium. I don't think there's yeah, any sure. other like faster way, but definitely do not try to spend 75 nights. <laughs> like that is, you know, unless he, you're a consultant he, or something. He might. He has some situation that I'm not fully aware of. Him or his wife or something. They have a lot of crazy travels. Uh, they talk about it okay. in the but I'm not fully aware. So they might be able to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's everything. Yeah, I think that's all the questions cool. that uh, they had and also I had. Um, so I will just say, um, <laughs> do you have any uh, parting wisdom for, for the people out in the world or anything like that? Yes, I think, I mean, credit cards are just you can get out what you want to put into it. If it's getting a couple of you know, free stays here and there, that's awesome. If, mm. it, if your goal is to try to, you know, get outside value and experience cool things you otherwise wouldn't have, that's even better. Um, but there's no one size fits all strategy. I think, I think too many of too much of the YouTube content I see is like, you know, follow this credit card tier list or strategy or, um, or what's the, the climb this ladder, right? Oh, I, I think yeah. that is overgeneralized. Um, different people have different goals. Um, there's a lot of nuance to this game. There are a lot of opportunity costs to juggle. So make sure you really consider all your options, like how you personally like to travel or use points. And yeah, there, there, and there's also another thing I've learned is like there's so much to learn. Like every day I'm learning new things about this game, even though I, I think I know a lot. I'm always learning from people like you, from you know other creators, from people on the Discord, um, from blogs, and and you know the game is constantly changing as people point out. It changes to loyalty programs, evaluation, whatever. You gotta you know adapt. And so, oh, thank you, Tim Watts. For <laughs> great live cast, great advice and insights. Yes. Yeah, so Thank you, Tim. that's my I take. Appreciate you, man. Mm-hmm. Um, and. Yeah, I give a lot more detailed takes on Sean and my podcast, Credit Card BS Podcast. So, um, you know, if some of what I've talked about was intriguing, uh, please consider checking it out. We're on uh, YouTube as well as Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you get your podcasts. Once a week. Oh, didn't know that. Yes, definitely. Um, I, I, it should be still in the pinned comment. Um, if not, it'll just be in the, the comment section, the pinned comment of, the, of this video. Um, but definitely, yeah. Freaking hit up the BS podcast. They have the best knowledge <laughs> out of anyone. I'm going to say it right now. I'm going to put my, wow, my book down. Thank you. Best knowledge out of anyone in this space. And they're only putting out more and more factual, uh, you know, spin the facts every single week on the, on this stuff. So highly recommend Sherwin and Sean of the BS podcast for sure. Um, thank you so much, uh, Super Chat. So we had uh, John, Joe Barreto, Vinyl, Keith and now Tim, appreciate all you guys for the, the super chats today and everybody in the chat. For you. It, was a, it was a fun time for me, yeah. hopefully, for everybody else as well. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and listening. And I had so much fun. Thank okay, you for having that was me my on. goal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for being on as well, definitely. Um, so, all right. So, I guess, uh, yeah, I guess everybody enjoy and uh, we'll be here next week, next Saturday, as always, all right, with somebody. <laughs> It's somebody we'll say, but uh, thank you again to Sherwin. Thank you, everybody who's watching. Awesome. And I guess I'll see you uh, next week. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anthony. Bye. See you guys. <laughs>